This is December 14th, 2018. We were in Bedford, Massachusetts at the Edith Morris Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey, and our camera person is Maureen Sullivan. And we're very privileged today to have with us Mr. George Thomas Palmer III. Welcome, George. Thank you. Good to have you, good, good to be here with you. May I ask where you were born? or uh, uh, when you were born? First half of the last century in Marlboro, Massachusetts. First half of the last century? Yeah. Okay, can you be a little more? 1948. 1948, okay. And you were born in Marlboro, Mass? Yeah, at Marlboro Hospital. Marlboro Hospital. And currently, you're living here at the uh, Bedford VA Hospital. Yeah. And uh, are you married? Yes, I am. I was married uh, I was married to a Southern Belle in Alabama in 1968, and uh, we divorced after I got back from Vietnam because she said I changed. So. Then I married a Yankee. I was married to her for 28 years, and we divorced, and I remarried her last year. Hmm. So. So where does your, uh, if I may ask, where, where does your wife live? She's in Marlboro. She's in Marlboro? Yeah. And do you have children? I have two boys, one in Alabama and one here. And ab about how old are your are your sons? My first son is 47 years old. My second son is 37 or 35. And do either of them have children? Do you have grandchildren? I have one granddaughter in Massachusetts, and I have three grandsons in Alabama. Oh, that's great. That's great. So where and when, so you, where, where did you grow, grow up? In Marlboro? Yes. You basically went, uh, did you have uh, siblings yourself, brothers and sisters? I have two sisters older. And are they still? Oh uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're around and kicking. Are they in Marlboro too? No, the one's in Franklin and one's, uh, she moved to Florida. Okay. So you went to basically to the through through the Marlboro school system, did you? Yeah, I went to the uh, vocational school, and uh, Marlboro. They changed. They discontinued the vocational school, and they have Assabet Valley Regional High uh, Vocational School now. But that was after I got out of there. Did 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 you have a did you learn something in particular at vocational school or were you specializing in something that I you was a body man. Like Let auto body auto, auto body? body. I so you so you learned that initially in vocational school. Yes. Okay. And I had my first car at seven. At what? Seven. At seven years old? Yeah, I my my parents used to have a a farm with horses, standard bred horses, and we had a track, and the people would rent stalls and jog their horses around the track, and I'd wash their cars to make money, and I bought a car off of one of the construction workers at seven. So what did you do with this car at seven? Drove it around the fields. At seven? Yeah. I started driving a bulldozer at four, a clee track, a, bull, a little bulldozer, a small one. It was only about five ton. It was a small dozer. 
And, uh, and what was the age of that? That was oh, old. I mean your your age. I was four. Four years old. Yeah, my mother go crazy because my father let me drive it across the field. He'd start it and I'd drive it. Uh, I guess to say the least, you had some early experience uh, in the automotive world. Yes. And I guess you didn't have to worry too much about police uh, enforcement of uh, driving age regulations and not so forth. not around the farm. I didn't. Wow. And if they had tried to catch me, I'd have run them over anyway. So. <laughs> oh, okay. So you were in Marlboro till. Uh, so so were you still in Marlboro when you decided to uh, enter the military? Yeah, I was. 19 when I went in. So had you finished I, up? I, I, I quit school and I got a GED in the Navy. Oh, so you went into, and which branch of the service? Uh, I joined the Navy to see the world, boy did I. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's what the Navy promises, right? Yeah. And they came through for you. Yeah, they did. I went to Great Lakes, Illinois to boot camp. And from boot camp at Great Lakes, I went to Pensacola, Florida to my first duty station. I was an OD messenger. I all the helicopter pilots. We trained helicopter pilots at that base. And uh, well, let's let's stop just one minute. I want to go go back. I think we're going to get to this. Uh, and you've given us a good start on your Navy c career. You went to basic in Great Lakes, uh, where is that, Illinois? Illinois, yeah. Um, by the way, wh uh, where where actually did you enter the Navy or sign up? Was it in I, Boston or? No, it was in Framingham, Mass. Framingham, Mass, okay. Yeah. And right away you went off to basic training. The afternoon after I said, yes, I will, and signed the paper, I was in Illinois that night. Hmm. Wrote, took a uh, train to the to Great Lakes. So but that didn't I, take long, did it? No. I don't remember how long it took exactly, but it wasn't long at all. We were there. I was there. I woke up in Great Lakes at 3 o'clock in the morning. They threw a trash can down the aisle and says, all right, whips, get out. And it's like, wait a minute, what time is it? Three o'clock. I ain't getting up this early. Oh, yes, you are. So that was your introduction to the, uh, to Navy, the Navy discipline. Yeah, so they call it. Why, by the way, why did you decide to join the Navy? Because I know I like walking in the jungle. <laughs> I'd rather ride in a boat. <laughs> so this was, uh, yeah, what, what, what year? This, you 1967. Were... So things were, had heated up. Uh... Big time in Vietnam, and I didn't want to walk in the jungle, so I decided to go on a boat. So you were registered for the draft. Yeah, I think I was number six or something like that. I'd have been gone. The Army and the Marines where they had me, they said, ain't no way I'm going on the water. I'd rather swim. So it was the Navy for you in 1967. So you were at boot camp, uh, and you chose the Navy because you really did want to see the world. Yeah. Did anybody, uh, family or friends, sign up? For military service at the same time that you did, or was no? Just, you they were told all, me I was crazy. Your family and friends? Yeah. Everybody says I ain't going in the service. I'm going to Canada. And uh, three or four people that I know that went to Canada are very wealthy today. Maybe I should have went. <laughs> huh? That's interesting. But you decided to stay, and uh, I did my duty. You did your duty. Well, good for you for doing it. Uh, so after your first day with the trash can and the 3 a.m. wake up, uh, what else can you tell us about? How, how long was boot camp? Six, six weeks? 
something like that. And the, I don't remember exactly. It was when I got there, it was hot, and when we left, it was get starting to get cold. So right, and that I was there in July. July 25th, 1967, I think it was till October, so however many weeks that is, I don't know. Right, so the fall of 67, you were done with boot camp. Yeah, and then I went to Sear School prior to going to Vietnam. Which school? Sear. What, what, what is that? Search, Evade, Rescue, and something or other. I can't remember what the last one is. It's S-E-R-C, uh, S-E-R. Now, just to, just to pause for a moment, you finished boot camp in October of 67, and I think you said earlier that you... Uh, That's when I went to, to Jackson, Pensacola. Pensacola. And that was Pensacola Naval, Naval Air Station? Or? Auxiliary Naval Air Station. Okay. And now uh, then it was, it was in a zero at least station and uh, it wasn't a real air station. It was just one they used during the war, I guess. And seeing how they were training helicopter pilots, they, they made it a uh, naval air station again. While you were there? Yeah. Okay. Now your rating uh, at the time was what? A fireman E3. And a fireman in the Navy is someone who works where? Down right? below, down in the hole. Da down in the engine room. No, the fire room. The fire. There's no engines on a ship. Oh, that's interesting. There's, you mean the boilers? So where the boilers? There's boilers and uh, steam turbines that run gears, and the gears turn the prop. Prope propellers, okay. Yeah. So the fire refers to boilers that are basically making steam. To turn the turbines. I see. But in Pensacola, there were no propellers or No, just, just the airplane, but helicopter props. So is, that was my first duty station. Right, right. Because I wasn't really designated. I was, I was, uh, I was just filling up space, basically. Right, but you, uh, uh, but it must have been a pretty active place. Heli helicopters played a big role in Vietnam, yeah. so a lot of these folks were they left headed there, for Vietnam. They left there after they trained, because the Huey Cobra just came out in 68 or 67, and we were getting them by the box, the tra uh, rail cars full of them. They'd be stacked like six or seven high in a wooden box. Hmm. And they'd bring them in on a truck and they'd bring them into the hangars and they'd close the doors and they'd tear them, put them all together and fire them up and then they'd take them out across the flight deck and fly them around. And your, and, but your specific duty, you said Was OD, your are a message is like if they're fogged in at main side, where they couldn't uh, land because they do flying with uh, small planes just for flight time and stuff. And if they couldn't land, they, they'd land at main side and I'd have to drive over to main side to pick them up, pick up the pilots. Oh, I, okay. To bring them back to the base because they couldn't land because of fog. Because we were right off of the water in Pensacola. Okay. The back side of the, the flight deck with all the tarmac was the ocean. Right on the ocean? Yeah. Okay. You could stand up on the top of the tarmac and throw a rock and hit the ocean. And so, um, and when you say flight deck, I mean, you mean run runway or was this right. a simulated carrier or something? A uh, runway. Right, right. But it's off the back side, it was, it was just straight down so you couldn't walk up to it. You know, it was like a, a guarded place where you couldn't sneak in because you'd have to climb straight up rock face. So it was secure? Yeah, supposedly. 
But who the hell would want to come look at a bunch of stupid helicopters anyway? <laughs> Of course, back then it was it wasn't like it is today, where they try it. But back right. then it was right. it was right. no big thing. Right. So you, I, I think you also told me about another duty you had. Some, something about ballast. Uh, oh yeah, when the when the helicopters would fly, they had to be balanced. So when the officers come into the uh, the office, the main office at Mainside, they come in and they ask me, hey, you feel like flying today? I said, sure. Because if I was about the same weight as the officers, they wouldn't have to put sandbags on the other side to level the helicopter out. And I'd get to go flying with them and they'd fly, I'd fly around with them and they let me fly the choppers. I never went up in a Huey, but I went up in the trainers all the time. And you actually flew it? Yeah, nothing to it. Left and right pedal, that runs your tail rotor, or your brakes when you're on the ground. Your right pedal, it'll, it'll turn the back of the helicopter like that, and your, your control stick, you got a stick over here, you twisted it, that was your throttle like a motorcycle. <laughs> and a stick in the middle, you left and right, pull it back and go up and change the rotation of the chopper, uh, the blades, and it goes straight up or straight down. And they have a thing they call auto-rotate. If you're up, say, a couple thousand feet and the motor dies, you push the stick all the way forward and then pull back on it. And it'll actually, as the air rushes by, it actually spin the rotor and keep you from crashing hard. You'll hit the ground pretty hard, but the seat underneath is built as an X. And it'll collapse when you hit the ground. So that's a kind of a shock absorber. Yeah, kind of. Wow. So did you ever say to yourself, I'd, I'd like to be a helicopter pilot? Nope. I had to be an officer for that. I, I, I understand. I understand. So I just, I just stayed behind the scenes. Well, that must have been pretty interesting. You must have had a, uh, I mean, that must have given you quite a perspective on what it was like, though, to be a helicopter pilot, thinking about those guys in Vietnam. And everybody shooting at you? Uh-uh. No, no thanks. Did you, did you ever run into, pil were pilots there to be trained initially, or were some back for retraining? Uh, no, you did, there wasn't too much retraining. Once you learned, you were gone. Okay. Okay. Wow. You went wow. out to out to your duty station in, in country, or you went aboard a, a, a aircraft carrier, something as a recovery. Yep. Wherever they needed you. Did they ever do uh, like practice landings on carriers from? Uh, they did that right on the tarmac. On the tarmac. Yeah, they they would they paint the uh, the flight deck up to simulate a carrier deck, and they just come in and land on it. it was, that was nothing for a helicopter. Helicopter just come in, just hover and set. But the problem with that is those aircraft carriers are doing 70 miles an hour in the water. Right, and 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 that's a, a big breeze all on the front. And not so much bouncing because they're so big. It's just kind of they make a cruise ship look like a toy boat. Right, right. They're huge. They're like, well, uh, they had drag racing on the flight uh, the flight deck. Uh, I can't remember his name, but they had a demonstration of because the flight deck's more than a quarter of a mile. Hmm. On a carrier. Yeah, on a carrier. They uh, they had a uh, demonstration of top fuel drag racer on the flight deck. I think it was the Enterprise. I'm not sure, but it might have been the Wasp or the Hornet or something. But I, no, I think it was the Enterprise. And they had a drag race up on the flight deck. Huh. 
<laughs> an actual race, drag race. An actual drag race, 300 miles an hour on a flight deck. And that's without the catapult. That's just drag race, rub up. Wow. Big ship. Yeah, they're pretty good size. They got like 6,500 guys on them. Right. Now there's guys and girls. <laughs> there's no uh, discrimination anymore. So you arrived in Pensacola in late 67. Yeah. And you were there uh, how long? Or until when, about? About November 68. 68. I was there for right around a year. And was it in November of 68 that you... Went was, to Vietnam. So November you got 17th, I think it was. And But I think you said that you got some special training. Uh, yeah, I got... I got the sent SEER to, training? Sent to Virginia for uh, two weeks. And we trudged through the jungle. The jungle it was the, the forest. It was picked clean. It looked like somebody went through there with a vacuum cleaner. Because hmm. everybody was picking everything that there was that was edible. It was all picked. Oh, so you were basically on your own. You had to survive? I had to survive. It was survival school. Right. And this basically, a lot of people who went, or most people who went to Vietnam had to get this kind of training? You had to, because you had to know what was coming if you got caught. So what was that experience? That was just, did you say that was a week? Two weeks. Two, two weeks. So what did you think of that? Did you learn anything about yourself? or I mean, was Yeah, it that I really kicking myself in my butt saying, why did I sign up for this? Because <laughs> it was in Virginia in November, and it was ice on oh. the puddles and uh, going to 130 degree temperature, and we're practicing in ice. I never figured that one out. But. So you got whatever the weather was at the time? Yep. Well, you survived, right? That was the idea, I guess, huh? Yeah. I stayed alive and kept my head down. So in a way, uh, after that, going to Vietnam was, what, kind of a piece of cake? No, it was uh, still hot kidding. in hell. I think it was hell. It was really hot. When, so this was in, so when did you get to Vietnam? About? I believe it was November 17th. Of 68? Yeah. So that that was about as it was hot in more ways than one in Vietnam. Yes. At that time, the Tet Offensive was earlier that year, right? Yes. It was. I believe it was the summer. They're still throwing a bunch at us, but. So where did you? Uh, uh, where where were you assigned in Vietnam and assigned to do what? I was in Da Nang, small craft repair. Small oh. craft repair. Yeah, any of the boats that go up and down the river, PBIs, LCNs, YFUs. Uh, the three small ones and uh, two big ones. The L I think it was an LCM was a bigger boat. I could you just uh, could you just tell us briefly what these uh, abbreviations stand for, if you can. LCM was landing craft, medium, medium size, meaning under 100 foot. Yes. And the YFU was uh, yard something. Yard fleet utility, I believe it was. Okay. And then the 100 footers, the 120 foot was, was, these were all flat bottom open open bow boats, so they could pull up and drop off. You, on the bigger ones, they put bulldozers and uh, tanks and stuff like that, and they'd just bring them right up to shore, open the bow, and they drive off, and we go back the other way. Were swift boats, uh, that's a term many people know. Yeah, it's PBI, same thing. Which stands for what, patrol boat or something? Patrol boat river. River, right, okay. P 
PB, so, I, the Navy does everything kind of backwards. It's, right. Instead I, I, of river patrol, it's patrol, patrol boat. boat, river. Right. And these were all basically boats that were being used in the river system in Vietnam? Yeah, brown water sailor, that's what I was. Brown water, so that was the brown water Navy? Yeah. And during, and I asked somebody to look that up for me, and the uh, brown water Navy started in the uh, Civil War, huh. going up and down the rivers because of brown water from the uh, mud and stuff. Like the Mississippi and so forth. So it's basically fresh water. It's fresh water, yes. It's not salt. It could be brackish, but. So. But these boats all needed, I'm sure they took a fair amount of abuse. So they, they used to take and put satchel charges and stuff under and blow them six feet in the air and they weigh 100,000 pounds. And when you say they, you mean the um, enemy, Viet yeah, Cong? And Viet Cong and NVA, they put satchel charges in the water. And they blow them up, yeah. Dem they blow them up and they blow them six feet out of water, they come down and sink. And then in the mid-69, we got a shear in that we had to cut a hole in the roof and drop it in by a big helicopter. But it was for cutting uh, armor plate. So that you could repair or, or put plating on these boats? We put, put armor plate all around the boat so when they try to blow them up, it just blow the paint off it. That's all it would do. It would lift the boat up in the air and drop it back in the water and just keep going. Was this for all kinds of boats, or the just Swiss steel, boats in particular? Just steel, PBIs, L I mean, LCMs, YFUs, and stuff like that. It was uh, boats that they'd blow up. The PBIs were non-magnetic, they were fiberglass. Oh, they were, oh, fiberglass. Yeah, so you couldn't stick a magnet to those, so. They'd put a cable across the river and you'd run into the cable and it'd pull something from uh, a bomb from the side of the bank of the river, pull it over and get you. That's what the enemy did? Yeah. Wow. So the repair, the... Uh... The repair on the PBIs, we'd take some of they'd get a shot hole through it, a big hole. We'd take a piece of plywood, uh, fiberglass it, screw it to the side of the boat, and then glass it in and ship it, keep them going. So basically the crews would bring the boats back into... If the they're able, or we'd send a, a repair boat out, put pumps in it, and put a plate or something on the side and suck the water out of it, raise it up, and then bring it back. The bigger boats, the metal ones, we'd send the barge out with a crane on it and pick them right up out of the water. Hmm. So this must have been a pretty substantial f facility that you were at, the small if boat. We, if we had a computer with uh, Google Earth on it, I could show it to you. It's still there. It is? It's still it's there? It's still there. The South Vietnamese Army is using it. Hmm. And all the boats, a lot of the boats are still there, too. Because I couldn't believe it when I looked it up on the computer. They were still all parked around the quay well. Wow, wow. So how many of, so, so, so you were there as a fireman, but you had, you had great expertise. I guess you were, what, 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 what were you doing specifically? Welding. You were a, a welder. I was keeping boats floating. And I'd fix props with brass ra brazen rod and stuff like that. That was like inch in diameter. So there were there were different Navy yeah, folks there doing yeah, different there was, things. we had five repair buildings at Smog. It was Camp Tenshaw where it was, Tenshaw Two. It was across the street from the old camp. Okay, right in the right. Uh, no, it was. It was Probably five, six miles from the airport. The Da Nang Airport? Yeah. Okay. And you must, you were right on, a, I guess, a river, a big river? What was the well, river? Well, it was the coast. I don't, it's like an inlet. Monkey Mountain was right across the street from okay. where we were. All right. 
the rock apes used to throw rocks up. And the Air Force had a, a, a club at the top of the mountain. And the, the yeah, I think somebody's doing doing some work. Let's maybe give it a break while we. So the monkeys, the apes on Monkey Mountain. They used to throw rocks up the mountain and uh, their arms were like six foot long. Hmm. And they'd throw rock the size of a coconut up the mountain and land on the, roof, the tin roof and you'd think it was incoming and when you first get there, you hit the floor. Everybody would laugh at you because they knew you was green. <laughs> but we'd go out and take that rock that rolled down off and land right next to the door you go out there and throw the rock back at the monkeys and you couldn't even begin to hit them. I mean, you couldn't even reach them. And we were throwing downhill and they were throwing uphill. And they'd go all the way up and land on the roof of the building. It's like, wait a minute. Amazingly strong. Amazing. So were you, were you living on Monkey Mountain? Nope. I lived at Camp Tenshaw. Okay, you lived right there where you were Right working? across the street from it. Route one, come down the road, and that's we were right off of Route one. Right off of Route one, which is the main north-south yeah, highway. Yeah, it's the only one there. Right, that or the river. But uh, so there were a bunch of different specialty jobs being done: it welding, there, the, the the electric shop, the diesel shop, the prop shop, the plate shop. The electricians, because if you need to rewire something, if it burn up or shot up, they you can full service, you know. Right, right. Drive it in. If you can get it in there, we'll fix it. So you must have had to, I mean, this must have been work that needed to be done ASAP. Yeah, there was no wait until next week. As soon as it came in, you fixed it. Everybody jumped on it, got it done. So were you basically, I mean, kind of on call 24-7 or? Um... Oh, I work uh, 12 hours a day. 12 um, hours? I worked at 6 at night till 6 in the morning. Okay, and that was your, that, that was basically a fixed schedule for you? Yeah, for uh, 395 days, that's what I did. 395, so you were? A little over a year. Yeah, a year and a month or so. Yeah. Wow. By the time we left, it was that. So, uh, um, were there, so you were vulnerable there, obviously. The enemy was uh, the Viet Cong or NBA. Maybe they could ride right down, the, they'd ride, walk right down the road and they wouldn't say nothing. They'd just walk right, march down the road because it was Route 1. And you'd tell them, say, hey, this, uh, this might not be politically correct, but uh, there's a bunch of gooks walking down the road and they said, don't worry about it. I mean, you should have shot them because they were coming at you at night trying to kill your ass, so. But you could, you you actually could identify them? Of course they were, they were uniform, carrying weapons. Yeah. Marching down the road. Ah. That's very, uh, that's very interesting. So was your, uh, was your base ever uh, ever attacked? Oh yeah, all the time. About once a month, they'd throw stuff at us about four o'clock in the morning. That's why I worked at night to be awake when they started dropping the stuff in the base. And what was what was this like? Um, rockets. A rocket. They they set rockets off across the street or up on the hill, and they dropped me down. It's like rain. And so what happened? I mean, so uh, say a rocket comes in. I mean, do you hear it as it's coming? Or yeah, oh yeah. 
One chased me down the pier, and the pier was 300 yards long, and it blew a big hole in the pier, and I got a little hole in my hand, thank God. That's all I got out of it. But I just ran as fast as I could. So you were you liter you were trying to escape it. I was trying to outrun it, but I was slow, I guess. But it it didn't get me directly, so I guess I moved fast enough. So so you were able to avoid the worst of it. Yeah, I got a piece of wood stuck through my hand from where it blew up on the pier. Wow. That was it. Did your unit take uh, casualties? I mean, I know. I mean, you were one. Uh, no, I just, uh, everybody, when you hear that stuff coming, you run and get in the bunker. Right. And the bunker's got three feet of sandbags on the top with a piece of two inch steel sitting underneath the sandbag. So you can get a direct hit, all it do is blow the sand off it. And so basically once the attack was over. Uh, everybody went back to work. Back to work. Turn the lights back on and go to work. Did you ever, uh, so did you ever, you must have talked from time to time with the crews of some of these boats? Every day. Every day. Because they'd come in, they'd park at the pier, and then they'd walk up to the office and request repairs. Oh, I see. So they would just bring the boat in. They bring the boat in, park at the, at the dock, because the dock was like 300 yards long, and it was like a T. Yes. So you could park on the end and up and down the sides. And you, they'd pull in if they needed handrails, and they hooked it on a branch or something going up the river, ripped the handrails <laughs> off. They'd pull in and say, I need a handrail on the port side. And you go out there and you cut some pipe and weld it on. I guess this isn't like here where you call the Toyota d dealership and say, I want to have my car serviced uh, no, next no, week. No, there's no way. Like I said, you just bring it right to it. So they just knew to come, they knew where you were. Well, if you pulled up at the PA, you just tell what stall you're in and what you need to get down there with tape measure, measure off what you need and go back to the shop, cut it, and bring it back. Huh. But if the damage was more severe, that then you pick it up with the crane and you set it on the on the on the quay wall, on the pier, the wall, cement wall, and you set it right there, and then run your leads down to it and fix it. But what what did the crew do in the meantime? Drank beer. <laughs> I mean, were most of these repairs things that could be done while they waited, or? A lot of them was why they waited. Like, they, if they, their boat needed work or paint or something, the, the old man of the boat would say, all right, we'll do a little chipping and painting while they're fixing that stuff. I get it. So they would do the more maintenance type maintenance stuff. Maintenance to the cleaning of machine guns. Huh. And it was really just up to the skipper of the boat. Exactly. Usually the second or first or second class. I see. A petty officer. Yeah. Did you ever go... Uh, so the swift boats got a lot of... A lot of people knew about or knew what swift boats were or at least had some sense even back here. Did, did you ever get a chance to uh, oh, I went up go on out it. on one? Quite a few times. You well, go out and ride around and shoot the quad fifties like toys. This is a this is a quad fifty caliber machine gun. Yeah, four of them put together and they all shoot at once. Mm. You cut down a jungle like it was a lawnmower. Just wipe out the tree, the vegetation along the vegetation gone though, <laughs> because the PVR is just about the same height as the behind the river. The so bank? What, yeah, the bank, and when you shot, it was pretty much the same. So how far would you, uh, when you went out with them, how far would you, I mean, would you be out for, you know, a couple of hours, or? All depends. You went out until they did what they had to do. 
Okay, so you went out. If they called them in for support, you had to stay on the boat. They wasn't going to make a special trip, turn around and bring you back. If you went out, you're going out on patrol with them. I see. So was there some job you were doing while, or while you no, were No, I was just shooting a machine gun, having a good time. That and drinking beer. <laughs> drinking beer on the boat? Oh, yeah. You get thirsty, it's hot, hot duty. What did you think of those guys on those boats? I mean, were they They're kind nuts. of a, They're nuts. Kind of a little bit. Uh, Not a little bit. They were nuts. In terms you, had, of, you had to be to stay alive out there. You had to be cuckoo. They were pretty much, I mean, in a way, they were sitting ducks. Not as fast as those boats were. Well, okay. So they could really... They can go so fast up the river, I swear to God, that we outran a couple of bullets a couple of times. Really? So as long as they had some kind of warning or something? No, there was no warning. And bullets would come out of anywhere. If they're laying down, if they're, they're laying down in the grass, you can't see them. But you see a puff or a flash, and you just open up and flatten all that stuff. And the boat... So the boats were very responsive. I mean, they, you could be doing 40 miles an hour and hit reverse and go like this and back up and go below that area, all the pieces. So, okay, so if someone shot at them, then they'd maneuver and then come back at them. Right, or just do a 180 <clears throat> flip right around. they just unbelievable. Wow, that must have, uh, well, that's... It was actually pretty cool, but it was scary as hell. I, and I, I, I talked to quite a few people that said they were never scared once, and I told them they were idiots. Because if you wasn't scared, you wasn't human. You mean people on those boats? On anywhere in Vietnam. Well? Unless they sat in an office where it was totally secure. Then you might not have been scared, but if you was out of the outside, you were scared, especially in the middle of the night walking patrols. I guarantee you get scared. You get chills up your back and you swear to God you're going to die and there's nothing there, but you swear to something. Anybody says who they were never scared, they lie. Right. I... Uh... I hear you. I hear you. Well, it's good to acknowledge it. Um, and yes. Well, that's uh, so you had a year and a month basically doing uh, this work, keeping these, keeping the Brownwater fleet uh, floating, active, floating, doing a critical job. And so you arrived in late 68. So what was it, early 70? that you... Uh, Christmas Eve of 1969, Christmas. I left. You did. So what did you think about as your, uh, as the time of, uh, approached? I mean, were you just... We had, everybody had short time in calendars, and they had them inside your locker. Short time is didn't start till you had 30 days. <laughs> and then every day you'd make a mark when you get up, you'd make a mark on the calendar. So you knew sometime ahead of time where, well. You knew that your time was up. Did you have your orders that early or? Uh? No, no, orders were issued when you get on the plane. Oh, I see, but, but you knew more uh, like a you month knew, in advance? You knew about where you were going, but. You didn't know exactly. They'd tell you the state you were going to, but they wouldn't tell you what the duty was. I see. Did you ever uh, have R&R? &R? One time I went to Hawaii for a week and met my wife. Wow. And she wanted to go shopping, and I drank. <laughs> <laughs> so you were... And I uh, sat at Don Ho's in, in the middle of the island. You had to have an ID of 21 to get in. She wasn't 21, she was only 20, so she couldn't go in. I sat at couldn't the Couldn't get in to see Don Ho? Don Ho? Nope, 
because you had to be 21. So this was in, this must have been uh, uh, Honolulu? Yeah, right downtown. Right. When was that, I mean, during your time there? Had, uh, that I mean, was, I think, I think it was June or July of 69 I got my eye on that. Okay, so you still had another uh, five or six months. Yeah. So the time uh, wound down. Uh, were you pretty excited to be getting out of there? Oh, you betcha. I couldn't wait to get home. And so the day came. Uh, you went and got on a plane? We flew to Hawaii, and the tail of the plane fell off when we were landing. The what? The tail of the plane the tail fell off? Plane, tail of the plane fell off from Dragon. See, when they take off from Vietnam, they got to oh. go so fast, the, the very tail of the plane would drag, <gasps> and it, three feet of the back of the plane fell off flying around Hawaii. So we had to fly around for like four hours to dump fuel. And then you land, what the then we landed, on the runway or and something? And when we landed, we get out, everybody get out, we look back and the back of the plane was gone. I was like, wait a minute, no wonder they had trouble handling the aircraft. Was this like a commercial jet? It was a uh, Northwest Orient uh, 707, I think yep. it was. Yep. I'm not exactly positive on the numbers, but I think it was a 707. So that so that's pretty ironic to um, yeah almost die and landing in Hawaii and then you gotta then you gotta wait an extra day to, for them to fly a plane out from California and then we took off from there huh fantastic well you must have been okay with uh... well we stopped we, we stopped in Guam before Hawaii everybody got five fifths of alcohol. Got one, and, five? Uh, like a travel case. Yes. Oh, yes. He was allowed up to five fifths, and everybody had one. And when they said they would be flying around dumping fuel to get to landing weight, every one of the bottles opened up. And we drank. <laughs> <coughs> we drank and drank. If we'd have crashed, we'd have burnt blue flame. But you would have been feeling no pain. No, it wouldn't have felt nothing. Well, having cheated death uh, uh, yet again, you uh, finally boarded another plane for where? San Bernardino, California. And we landed in San Bernardino. I was gonna, my wife was in Mobile and uh, I couldn't go to Mobile because Hurricane Camille had went through there in August and, uh, or July and flattened everything, so there was no airport left, so we couldn't go there. We had to fly to New Orleans, and they'd take a bus back from New Orleans. A bus from New Orleans to Mobile? Mobile yeah. That's pretty good. Like 120 miles. Oh, okay. So you finally uh, got I home. finally got home. And then I, my order was saying I'd go to Seattle, Washington from, and uh, we left Mobile right at two days after I got there. And we went up, back up to Massachusetts, back up here to see my, my father and mother and stuff and my sisters. So you so you only had two days in Mobile, is that what you said? Yeah. And then how long did you have? So were you? Were you I had you, thirty days all total. Thirty days leave. Yeah. After Vietnam, so yeah. did you spend most of that time in Massachusetts? Yeah, that and it took a week to get across. Back across to Washington. Washington State, Seattle. Let me ask you this: um, So you, for at least. 30 days right after you left Vietnam, you were kind of back in uh, civilian, I mean, you were with the civilian population. Yeah. What sort of, uh, do you recall 
any kind of folks reaction to you or did you talk much about your service? No, or? I didn't say a word. I just went about my business and I was always in civilian clothes so nobody knew the difference. And why? I mean, did you? No, because I seen on TV all the garbage that was going on. I didn't say a word. It's called cover thine ass. Yes. Yeah, I understand. That was kind of the right. Incognito. So you were with family. Did you talk much with uh, your family, your wife, about kind of what you'd no, done? Or? No, no. I just told them I was a welder, which it wasn't a lie. Right, 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 right. Well, it must have been. I fixed boats, period. Did you enjoy your time off for those few weeks? Oh, yeah. Definitely. And then I went and trained reserves up in Seattle. So you went to Seattle, and uh, so by then it was what? You were into 1970, I guess, right? Or uh, this was early 70? Yeah. Okay, and what was your... Uh, what, what I was in till 71. So what was your assignment in Seattle? Reserve trainer aboard a destroyer escort. So by that you were training reserves? Yeah. Who would what, come in for? Yeah, the reserves that came in to us were from the Midwest. They'd never even seen a boat before. Were these coming right from boot camp? No, no, wait. No, no, no. No, no they weren't. This was a reserve. Reserves. The reserves that were living in like Iowa, Indiana, and stuff like that. Right. They'd never even seen a boat, but some of them were chiefs that they never even been on a boat because they were chiefs because they take the test at the reserve station and they pass the test and they become a chief up to an E7. And then they'd have to come aboard the ship in Seattle and learn how to even light a boiler, and never mind operate one. Hmm. And they'd already made it to E7 somehow. Yeah, taking the test. Huh. See, in the Navy, what you do is that when it comes time, they have a quota to fill. And they need say they say they need 25 first class, 15 second class. <clears throat> They'll take and uh, put the quota out, and that report goes to every ship in the fleet. So if, like, if you're a, a second-class radio man and they need some first class to go on a carrier or something like that, you take the test right there on the boat. They ship you the test, you take the test. If you pass the test, you get promoted if okay. there's a quota for it. Right. If there's not, then you don't get to take tests. So you were on the ship to train reserves? Yeah. And what did you train them in to do? Oh. Damage control, how to keep a boat afloat if it was hit, uh, firefighting. So damage can so so in other words, this would be to help keep the boat from sinking. Yeah, the if, you, if the ship got a torpedo on the side or something like that, and blew a big hole in it, you were supposed to while the water was coming in, you were supposed to take take a, a table off the mesh deck and the mattresses from the bunks. You use the box as a gasket, and you put the table up against the hole. And then you shore it tight with a wood dunnage, which was all around the the hull of the ship. Huh? And you put a like a twelve foot six by six up against the back of the table, and you drive two wedges at the end of it to tighten it. Wow, I had no idea. So all of this wood is stationed around the ship? Yeah. Just for that purpose? Exactly. And it was on the inside, like in the fire room, where you got steel gunnels <coughs> coming up from the side of the boat, bracing. And you'd have a board sitting, out, board sitting all the way around. And it was for that. 
So you were training them in, in that, in damage control? Damage control, you cut around, the, like if you get hit in the prop and it blew it up and it bent it, you cut around the prop with a torch to relieve the bulkhead so it could still spin slowly, but it would still spin. I see. Wow. That sounds like pretty technical. Uh... It was all in a book, you know. There's, they tell you the scenario and you you take and follow it out and train the people that don't have a clue. Right. And we do 10 or 12 uh, training sessions per week out at sea. So the so when the reserves came, uh, see they you'd have, go off to out to sea. When the reserves came, we'd go out for two weeks, go stay out floating around doing different scenarios, like we'd be chasing submarines, which was only like a a beeper in water or something. They drop it from a helicopter. And they say that was a submarine. We had to go get it. I see. The destroyer escort. Right. right which was its right a job. To and we had a uh, we had a torpedo aboard ship that was on the flight deck, uh, hello deck. And we had a drone helicopter. The ship I was on was built in '55, so it was relatively new. We had a. Uh, a torpedo aboard ship that would come at you seven times. In other words, if it went by you and missed you, it would come back at you seven times, all electronically controlled. This was early electronics now. Huh. And it was it was 11 feet long and three foot in diameter. And we used to drink the, the alcohol out of it, run it through a loaf of bread. <laughs> <clears throat> the alcohol was the fuel? Pure grain alcohol. Hmm. So, so, the, so, but the idea was to try to evade this torpedo? No, the torpedo, we'd send it out after the, the oh, sightings. I, after the, uh, to try to get the sub? Right. I, okay, I see. Wow, that's Or nice. a surface ship, whatever it was, whatever they called for. So basically, you sailed uh, from Seattle. Seattle to San Diego, and any place off the West Coast, we'd have practice. Okay, and then you eventually returned to Seattle by the end of two weeks? Yeah. And the reservists would go? The and... reservists would leave, and we'd work on the ship for a week, and then we'd get more. I, I see. Well, keeping the flow of personnel going. So if they needed people somewhere, then they'd call the reserves. They'd be already trained. Right. That sounds like uh, that's a, that's important work. Well, I don't know how important it was. Them people sure didn't like being there. Not at all. So how did you enjoy that part of your uh, Navy they, career? They used to get sick before we'd start the oh start the boilers, and, and it was nothing but quiet. Just Ooh, a little bit of noise from the turbines blowing air into the boilers. And they'd be hanging over the side, puking in the water, and the boat <laughs> hadn't even moved yet. So they were struggling a little bit with seasickness uh, from a little the, mid bit. The, the Midwest? They'd puke everywhere. And we'd let them finish puking and hand them a mop and a bucket and say, now clean it up. Mm. And hand them a pack of crackers, a saltine crackers, and say, eat these, it'll keep your stomach down. Some of them must have had a miserable couple of weeks. Yeah, a lot of them, they, they couldn't figure it out, and they'd throw up the whole two weeks they were there. Mm. Mm. You keep telling them, put some water in your belly and throw up the water, and then your guts won't come up. And he said, oh, I can't drink nothing. It's, I'm sick. I'm sick. <laughs> well, you, uh, I'm sure you didn't. Well, maybe you, let's uh, see, that no, was your I, first shipboard time. So you, initially, did you have any trouble with seasickness? No, nope, not once. 
Good. One time I, I came in from uh, Liberty and I was a little hungover and I had a little bit of problem when we went out, but <laughs> I never blew chunks. Well, that's good. So that, your duty there in Seattle, that was your last uh, duty? Yeah, I, I was released from the service due to decrease in personnel. As the wind down from... I got 147 day early out. I said, bye. You took you took it? Oh, you betcha. And that was about, when, when did you, uh, when did you, were you discharged? Approximately? April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day of 19, of what? 71? 70. 70, okay. That's uh, no, maybe 70, so 71, you 71, right. Right, right. 71, because I was a year aboard ship, so. So you, uh, so you left, so where, so you left Seattle to come, to go where? Massachusetts. Back to civilian life. Yep. And how was the uh, transition to civilian life, that is? I had 36 jobs the first year. The second year, I had 23. I didn't like orders. I still don't like orders. When you say 36, you mean 30 jobs? Where you you basically left one job and went to another? I quit one, went to another. Quit right. that one, and went to another. So you? I I couldn't deal with idiots. So if there were idiots, I just quit and leave. So how did that how did that work in the Navy? I mean, uh, I couldn't go nowhere in the Navy. You couldn't go. You what? I couldn't go anywhere. Otherwise, I would have quit it too. But I couldn't. But was it was it? It must have been tough for you to deal. I mean, discipline is part of the military way, orders and so right. forth. Right. You got to do it when you're in the service. I, I you guess you're right. You don't got to do it when you're out right. civilian right. life. Right. You do what you please. So basically you did what you had to do uh, in the Navy. Yeah. But when you got out, you did what you wanted. Sign out. See you later. And see, when I first got out, Well, after uh, my wife and I got divorced, I pretty much did what I wanted. She said I changed too much from the war, so I didn't realize I did, but I had, so. Had I gone and tried to get some help when I first got out, I'd probably been a lot better off, but I never did. Of course, I didn't know there was help out there right. to be had, so. A lot of, uh, uh, that, that was true in probably almost all cases. People didn't know. So you basically stayed in Massachusetts? Yeah, until 1985, and then I went to uh, Arizona till 92, 93. What'd you do in Arizona? Worked for VF Goodrich Aerospace, making slide rafts and stuff. They go in the side doors of the airplanes for Boeing. You mean the for escape? Purpose? Yeah. I oh okay. Huh. That's what I did for I don't know a couple of years, I guess. And then did you come back to Massachusetts from there? Uh, yeah, ninety-three. I came back. Did you uh, uh, ever? So, so when you finally when you came home after Seattle, did you then? Did you ever talk with anybody about your no, service and stuff? No. Or, Pretty, pretty much kept that to yourself. It was always to myself. I didn't want to bring it up. It took me too long to put it away, so. Right, right. I just left it buried. And were you in the reserves or? No, yeah. after, after going to Vietnam, you was uh, null and void for and have to be in the reserves. I see. They, they counted that as uh, time served. And what about veterans organizations like the American? No, no, I never joined any of those until 
like two years ago. What did you join? What I happened? joined the VFW and uh, the Moose and uh, the American Legion. I joined them all, but then they got too expensive. Huh. So were you? Did you do that when you were here, or was that while you were I in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts. Yeah. I see. A question: Do you remember your Navy serial number? B eleven eighty four ninety seven. I remember mine too. I just uh, something I don't think you forget. No, not as many times as they asked you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Drill okay. it right in the head. So, have you ever, do you ever, uh, were you ever, or are you, in touch with anybody you served? No, with? I've never been able to find anybody. I don't know whether they died off. Uh, right, right. They just don't want to talk to me, or, or they don't remember it. Well, it's hard to hard to find people, although. With the computers and so forth these days, it's a little easier, but still. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked in, say, 10 years, so. So. A lot of the people I was with they either died of cancer or alcohol poisoning. <laughs> wow. Well, we drank for the whole time we were there. Because I said, well, if I'm going to die, I won't know when they shoot me. So, so we drank. So you you consumed your your fair share of uh, whatever it was. Whatever it was, as long as it had an alcohol content, that's all it mattered. I think you told me something about the beer. There was something about beer from the beer the, from the U.S. had formaldehyde in it to preserve it. To preserve the beer so it wouldn't get old. So you and didn't, we would used to drink all the. All the alcohol that came in, the beer that came in from the Philippines didn't have it in there. Boy, was it good. San Miguel. But see, that's why we all drank hard liquor, because it didn't have formaldehyde <laughs> in it. So it sounds like pretty much whatever you had access to, you managed to... Yeah, if uh, we could have figured out a way to drink gasoline and diesel <laughs> fuel, we probably would have. <laughs> but... Well, you survived it all. Yeah, so, so they say. So, looking back, I mean, how, how important to you was serving in the military? What do you, what do you think about your decision to enlist and to go, go in the over and fight? I think it was a bunch of baloney myself. It was political more than anything. You mean the war? Yeah. Yep. But in terms of your life, was this a good, uh, a, a good move that you made at the time? I guess it was. I'm, I mean, not, I'm not positive, but... It's what you did. That's what I had to do, so I did it. And if, how, how, how do you think it's affected your life? Screwed me up. And the worst part of it is it's been over 50 years and it's still affected me. Well, but maybe, well, now that you know that, maybe, maybe there'll be some help. Maybe. We'll see. Well, I hope so. I got to get over the anger issues. That's what I got to get over. Yep. I get angry too fast. But I have always had a temper like that. But after I went there and I just popped quick. Like turning on a light switch. Yep. You got to learn how to get, put that stuff away. It took me a long time to put away the fear, but. Well, but you've, you're able to, probably pretty important to be able to talk about it and... Well, see, that's what I mean. I, I, that's why I put it away so I wouldn't have to talk about I, it. I, I understand. I understand. And then everybody wants to turn it up and make you feel bad again. Right, right. Well, listen, uh, if you look back on it all, I mean, can you, 
think about a memorable experience uh, in your time in the Navy or a memorable character or, you know, something even funny? I mean, what, is, what kind of sticks with you? Um, a person. Um, Shag really? Nasty. What? Shag Nasty. Shag? Yeah, Stephen Sasky. Oh, Stars Starsky? Stas Sasky, S-A-S-K-I. I got it. He was a Polak from, uh, uh, let's see, what, what was the name of that town? Uh, um, Elizabeth, New Jersey. Hmm. He lived up in the mountains or next to the uh, state forest. He'd go up there with his Jeep and they'd hunt deer and stuff. And we went there for Thanksgiving before we went to Vietnam. We had turkey, wild turkey, deer, duck, everything. Did you go to Vietnam with him? Yeah. W was he in the small boat unit? Shag was on a PBR. Oh, he, he was on a PBR. He was on a station on a PBR. That was his duty. Oh. My duty was at the P right, at right. the the Quay well to right. repair. But was he a, was this a fellow that you've known from boot camp? Oh from boot camp. Yeah. So did you see each other in uh Vietnam? Yeah, we drank all the time. <laughs> So, that's a pretty much the only thing you could do, drink and do your job. So he became a, you, you and he were buddies. Yeah, good friends. And he took you to hunt at his uh, yeah, party. Yeah, at his house for Thanksgiving. Oh, that's a nice memory. So as we kind of wind down here, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share with? Uh, no, that's pretty much my whole life. Well, listen, you've uh, shared a great deal of your uh, not only experiences, but feelings and thoughts about your time in the Navy. And uh, it's been a great interview. And we really appreciate your doing it. So I guess at this point I'd say thank you, George Thomas Palmer III, for your participation in the program. Thank right, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.